Good afternoon. I am Marcia Ferranto, the CEO of the National Law Enforcement Memorial Museum. Thank you for joining us here today for this exciting program. Forensic science plays an integral role in the work of law enforcement throughout the country. The field of forensic science is always evolving with new technologies and scientific methodologies being created to analyze evidence and put together the complicated pieces of an investigation. Evidence is analyzed by trained scientists who work collaboratively with law enforcement agencies to bring justice to the millions of victims of crime and their families each year. In Washington, DC, there are upwards of 27 separate law enforcement agencies with overlapping jurisdictions and evidence that needs to be analyzed. The DC Department of Forensic Sciences is the largest publicly funded lab in the United States and serves each of these agencies with their work. Before we get started with the program, I have a few housekeeping items for you. Uh, to all the attendees, you're all muted. If you would like to ask a question, please submit your question through the Q&A tab. Please note that everyone in the webinar will be able to see your question. You can upvote questions submitted by other attendees. Our staff working behind the scenes will prioritize answering the questions that receive the most votes. A link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to everyone in two days and will also be available on our museum's YouTube channel. We are also committed to providing greater accessibility to our programs, and we are providing closed captioning for you today. Panelists, please remember to keep yourselves on mute when you are not speaking. So without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Smith, the Director of the Department of Forensic Sciences. Dr. Smith is a retired FBI special agent, having served for 23 years. At the FBI, Dr. Smith oversaw DNA analysis and testified in hundreds of cases. As a member of the US Department Senior Executive Service, her final ass assignment with the FBI was Chief of the Weapons of Mass Destruction Intelligence Analysis Section. Dr. Smith also led the CIA's Biological Technology Center and has served on several federal advisory groups that support national security entities concerned with microbial forensics. Throughout her tenure, Dr. Smith has guided the district's public health laboratory during the testing of COVID-19 and guided the crime scene sciences and forensic science laboratory divisions to ensure evidence submitted to the lab undergoes the highest quality of testing and analysis. So Dr. Smith, welcome. I will turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Marsha. And thank you so much to the uh, National Law Enforcement Memorial Museum uh, uh, for inviting us to participate today in our virtual tour of the Department of Forensic Sciences. So first of all, let me welcome you to the Consolidated Forensic Laboratory Building. This is actually where we are housed. Our department is here, as well as our sister agency, which is the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. It's a 351,000 square foot building that has 
amazing laboratory spaces. And if we were under more normal times, we'd be able to actually invite you in for a real tour. But today we're going to do it virtually and we have a lot of activities lined up for you. I also want to point out that this is a special room to us. This is a room that we call our Karen Wiggins room because it honors our recently retired Ms. Wiggins, who was deputy director of the Department of Forensic Sciences. She is a native Washingtonian. She spent over 40 years dedicated to forensic science. And we honor her because she was the first female African-American firearms examiner here in the district. She was trained by the FBI and she spent all of her life working for the citizens of the district. And she represents what is one of kind of our thoughts here. We call ourselves the People's Lab because we actually work for the citizens of DC. Unlike many law enforcement crime labs, they work often for police departments or they may work for prosecutors offices. offices. But we actually work directly for the mayor. We work for the citizens of DC. We also work for all the visitors that come to DC. Maybe some of you have been here before. And we work for all the men and women who come here and work throughout the day and maybe live in the surrounding regions. And that's a lot of work to do because as you will see in some, an upcoming video that we're gonna show you, we'll give you a sneak peek about what things have been going on. But before we start the video, I want to also mention that we are accredited. We deliver unbiased science, but it's important for people to come in and inspect us and ensure that the type of science we're delivering is the best quality and that our people are proficient at their task. So we are an accredited agency and we are accredited to deliver services that deal with firearms testing, latent fingerprint testing, DNA testing, digital evidence testing, as well as forensic chemistry. We're not gonna be able to talk about all of those disciplines today, but we are gonna to touch base on some of those. We have three divisions here within the Department of Forensic Sciences. We have our Crime Scene Sciences Division, and we're going to hear more about what they do today. We also have our Forensic Science Lab Division, and we'll take a deeper dive into those activities too. The third division that you may have heard something about is our public health lab division. And they are leading the effort here in DC to do COVID-19 testing. So they're all very, very busy. We're not gonna spend too much time talking about them, but I don't wanna forget them because they're upstairs and they're all very important. That's the last thing I wanna talk about. We are all actively working here in this laboratory. We have crime still going on in the city, we have evidence to collect, we have evidence to process. And despite the fact that many people are working from home during the health emergency that is before us, not the folks here at DFS. Our scientists are working on the streets of DC, the evidence is coming in here, they're coming in here and they're working in the laboratories as we speak. Because they're all very busy, we couldn't have them all down here talking to you. So we have a second video that we'll talk about that actually has some of the folks so you can get some insights from them as to what it feels like to be a forensic scientist. But before we get to that, let's start with our first video, our first video that will give you that inside peek into the Department of Forensic Sciences. As the COVID-19 pandemic and the mayor's orders to stay home reduce the violence in our city, well, when it comes to killers, not so much. Videos posted to social media show hundreds of people at a block party early Sunday morning. Not that soon. What I heard was bop, 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 bop. And it's absolutely ridiculous that anybody would, would do that in our community. Uh, it's insane. There's a lot of crime still going on. There's still a lot of homicides. In just in the last couple months, we brought in almost 12,000 pieces of evidence. A 
busy day will be mainly like Mondays or so okay. because it's, it, um, evidence is coming in from over the weekend. We have at least about over 300, 300 so pieces. You would think that it's getting better. It's not getting no better. So it appears the criminals are not adhering to social distancing guidelines. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser says at least three murders committed last year in D.C. involved ghost guns. We're talking homemade weapons with no serial numbers, virtually untraceable. Just because they're considered untraceable does not mean they are incapable of causing irreparable harm. These are real guns. This ghost gun here is compiled of parts that are bought online and it does not contain a serial number. In 2017, MPD recovered three ghost guns. In 2018, that number jumped to 25. Uh, last year, in 2019, we recovered 116 ghost guns. And this year, we are on track to eclipse the 2019 ghost gun recoveries. At the department, our firearms examiners are able to take this evidence from these ghost guns and still do all the testing that we would do on any other gun. Four states have enacted laws regulating or prohibiting these guns, including California, which has had three mass shootings by people using ghost guns. So we need to take the action as we're watching this uh, trend develop. There is unique features within everyone's fingerprints. Um, that's what makes them yours. And those are those details that, as examiners, we visualize and rely on in our examination process to be able to form a conclusion, whether that is an identification to a person or we are able to exclude them as the, the source of that print. There are some overall class characteristics that, that you can observe um, pretty readily. Um, fingerprints are broken down into three basic pattern types. There are more loops than all the other pattern types. And then the next um, popular um, pattern type are whorls, and the least is arches. That's just an overall class characteristic. We can group people together like that. We can't just identify on pattern alone. D.C. is sending a strong message to victims of sexual assault. It wasn't something that I ever thought could happen to me. Today, Mayor Muriel Bowser signing legislation that strengthens and improves outcomes for survivors of those assaults. It's called the Sexual Assault Victims' Rights Amendment Act of 2019, also referred to as SAVRA 2.0. Your support and vision ensures that victim survivors remain a top priority of the city. From the forensic chemistry unit, we plot the distribution of fentanyl to sort of gauge an idea of if people have drugs in the region uh, illicitly, what is the probability of, of it actually being fentanyl laced? And yes, indeed, about 23% uh, were taking um, fentanyl either deliberately or, or inadvertently through the um, uh, medications they're taking. Opioids, heroin, fentanyl, and fentanyl-like substances have ravaged communities of all of us. Fentanyl sets an issue uh, with very low levels of other things like U47700 and uh, acetylfentanyl uh, and 4 furanyl, uh, furanyl fentanyl were also picked up. At the DC Forensics Lab, Cybersecurity Chief Tracy Walraven tells us criminals who would want to hack into the new video display you got your mom probably aren't looking to watch her cook dinner. People are looking for new ways to get into your stuff. So when you're out and you see cameras that are in front of somebody's house or on a business, there's a recorder that's saving off that video. And there's some instances when the detective will bring the video recorder to us and we'll copy all the information from the recorder and then look through the videos to see if it captured anything of interest to their particular incident. Hackers can access the video from any security camera inside your house too. Everything digital at this point in time is permanent. So unless you're doing a straight wipe, like an NSA wipe on a drive, you can recover any deleted digital data.
So welcome back. So in that video, you saw a little bit from each of the disciplines that we actually uh, are able to <laughs> house here and work through at the Department of Forensic Sciences. It featured problems that are, are happening here. For example, ghost guns. Ghost guns are guns that cannot be traced because they don't have serial numbers on them. The other thing that um, is, was in the film, we talked about sexual assault kits. I don't know if you know this, but every sexual assault kit that is collected here in the district comes to this laboratory. We work them. And as a result of all the effort that has gone on to make sure we have the resources we need, we have a zero rape kit backlog. That means we have worked all of them within the required 90 days, often sometimes sooner than 90 days. So that's a fact that we're very, very proud of. Additionally, we talked about latent fingerprints and we talked about our cyber section um, in the film. And so we're gonna find out a little bit more about those things because I have two special guests here with me. First of all, my I will turn to Chris Logicono. Chris Logicono is the Crime Scene Sciences Director. Now, Chris comes to us actually from a law enforcement background as do all three of us. He, his, in his investigative experience was with the Metropolitan Police Department. Not only did he start out as an officer on the streets, but he rose through the ranks to become commander of the Metropolitan, a, a commander within the Metropolitan Police Department. So Chris also, while he was going through his career at MPD, he actually did take a stint to be in charge of what was then called the Forensic Science Division because prior to the Department of Forensic Sciences being formed, most of the forensic work was actually done by the Metropolitan Police Department within their Forensic Sciences Division. And at some point in time, Mr. Logicano was actually in charge of that division. And he brings that experience as well as his investigative experiences to the Department of Forensic Sciences. The other person that I have, I have joining me is Wayne Arenzi. He is the director of the other division, the Forensic Science Laboratory Division that joins me today. And just like Chris and just like myself, he comes through a law enforcement background. He actually also comes to us from South Africa. So if you notice a slight accent, a beautiful <laughs> accent, that's because that's where Wayne actually grew up. But he comes to us from there with a wealth of experience as a firearms examiner and also as an auditor. Remember, I talked a little bit about quality. He actually is specially trained to help conduct quality audits of other forensic laboratories. But now his main job is making sure that the Forensic Sciences Lab Division runs very smoothly. So I have a couple questions that I'm going to ask of these two folks. And I'm going to start with Chris. And I'll put my mask back on after I ask the question. So, um, Mr. Logicono, can you tell the folks what happens in the Crime Scene Sciences Division? Well, thank you, Dr. Smith, for asking. Um, I have a slight accent also. It's called a native Washingtonian right. accent. Um, so, anyhow, uh, so in the Crime Scene Sciences Division, we have two different units, the Crime Scene Sciences Unit and the Central Evidence Unit. So the Crime Scene Sciences Unit, they're the forensic scientists that go out and process the crime scenes in Washington, D.C. Um, we do not process all the crime scenes in Washington, D.C. There's just too many of them for us to get around to. So we split that duty with the Metropolitan Police Department. But we do the most serious crimes in the District of Columbia. So when our crime scene scientists go out, we're going to homicides, assault with intent to kill, carjackings, serious armed robberies, et cetera. And we're processing those scenes. Um, the scientists will monitor the radio just like the police department does. Uh, they'll get the assignment respond out to the location and they'll meet with the detective, get um, the general information about what occurred on the scene and then they'll evaluate the scene and start processing it for evidence. Um, they'll document the condition of the scene, where the evidence is located and um, so collect the physical evidence and also process it if appropriate for latent fingerprints and DNA, any DNA uh, sampling that might be on the scene. Um, some of it will occur out on the street, the majority of it does, 
Um, but in certain instances, we do have a garage here at DFS and we'll tow cars in, which allow us to uh, do a more thorough processing under um, conditions where we may have additional tools uh, that we can work on vehicles. Um, and then, of course, everything they collect then goes and is taken in at the central evidence unit, which is the hub for all the evidence coming into the Department of Forensic Sciences. And the central evidence unit makes sure that all the evidence gets distributed to all the other units you're going to hear about, such as latent fingerprints, uh, forensic biology, digital evidence unit, firearms, et cetera. And they'll make sure that it gets there so they can do their analysis in a timely manner. And then when they're finished with it, it comes back to the central evidence unit and they make sure that it gets over back over to the Metropolitan Police Department, who has a long term storage facility at the evidence control branch. So generally speaking, that's uh, what we do. So I know a lot of you probably watch crime scene television and shows. So this is one area where I think sometimes it may be a little bit different. So kind of what's actually a typical day for a crime scene scientist on the streets of DC? So um, a typical day is, of course, you don't know what's going to happen. You could have a very slow day and you're actually catching up on paperwork. We have to do paperwork. We have a, a responsibility to get all our reports out to our stakeholders like the Metropolitan Police Department or the US Attorney's Office or you could come in and have a homicide right off the bat. The one thing about crime, you never know when it's going to happen. So it can happen during the day, evening, midnight hours, um, and it can be slow or busy. You are out on the street. So um, you're out in the elements, you're working in any condition. If it's 100 degrees out, you're out there. If it's you know minus 20, you're out there. You don't get to take a break just because uh, the weather isn't cooperating. You can be in a torrential downpour. It really doesn't matter. And you are there until you finish your job. So you could be here, even though most of our scientists work a 10 hour shift. If you have to be here for 16 hours, you're here for 16 hours. You're here until you get the evidence to a point where you can leave for the day. So. Um, it, you really do have to, I mean, it sometimes is difficult for making plans, doing things around your social life because um, like other first responders, you're here till the job is completed. I, and also I think it's important that, like you said, it's long hours and it, it's very time consuming to, and it's painstaking work sometimes to document all that, even though it may be raining or snowing or um, ugly conditions out there. So the last question I want to ask you is you and Wayne and myself, we all kind of came through into forensic science through the law enforcement path. Is that typical nowadays? Do most of our scientists, especially in crime scenes, are they going down that path? So um, for years, uh, most of the Crime scene technicians were assigned to police departments, and that was kind of the model. Um, probably about 20 years ago, police departments started to look at whether or not that was an efficient way of doing things, if you had to be a police officer to be able to process crime scenes. And more and more, they started to look at civilianizing their um, crime scene units. So yes, at one point in time, you had to join the police department, become a police officer, and then um, over the course of time, maybe you can get into the crime scene unit. Now, you, there's many colleges and graduate programs that um, you can take and learn crime scene sciences and actually come in at an entry level. So I would say, I don't know what the percentage is, but more and more, um, even if they're attached to police departments, are going to a civilianized workforce and you can actually come in at an entry level. Um, but there's still a lot that's still going the traditional route of going through the police department. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. Well, one thing that has happened that we noticed at the Department of Forensic Sciences as a result of not necessarily having to go through that law enforcement path, we have a very high percentage of employees that are women. In fact, 
we have more women that work in the Department of Forensic Sciences, both in crime scene sciences and in forensic sciences. So we actually have a higher percentage of women that are coming into this field. Maybe that might be one of the reasons why, because it's no longer a requirement necessarily to take that law, law enforcement path. So now, Wayne, it's your turn. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome, Director. Good job. <laughs> so once the evidence is collected by the crime scene sciences team, it comes into the laboratory and is handled by the central evidence unit teams. What are some of the different forensic science services that are offered in the forensic science laboratory division, as well as other parts of DFS? So um, thank you. So the Department of Forensic Sciences houses five different forensic science units. So we have our chemistry unit, we have our digital evidence, and we heard a little bit about that in our video. We also have the firearms examination unit and our uh, latent fingerprints unit. And we also have our forensic biology unit. So those are the type of services. So as Chris mentioned, so when the evidence is identified on the scene, preserved and collected, it comes through our center um, receiving unit and then goes into our evidence processing. So in our evidence processing unit, let's say, for example, they process a firearm chemically, they will take a swab, the swab might go to the biology unit and then they will do a DNA profile. And then if it's eligible, it will go into CODIS. The firearm itself, um, and they might also find some fingerprints on it, and we'll send that to the latent, um, uh, the latent unit. The firearm itself will go through to the firearms unit, and we typically in the firearms unit process anything from two to three thousand firearms. You heard earlier about um, the ghost guns, which they monitor closely, um, and then they will do their testing. So. Uh, Typically, you would analyze, you would test uh, the various evidence that Chris's team collect, and then you have to take it a step further. You then have to, the results, you're going to have to draft and put it in a scientific report, and then um, you'll issue that back to the customer. Typically, law enforcement, we have other couple of uh, customers as well. So, and then the other service we provide, if you want to be a forensic scientist, you have to make sure that you um, have the ability, you're gonna to have to testify as an expert witness. Um, you're going to have to attend witness conferences. You have the prosecutors that want to, because remember, we're providing aid within the criminal justice system. So you want to make sure that you make yourself available um, and that you remain competent and proficient because eventually you're going to have to testify. Part of um, our Department of Forensic Sciences too we have a, a general counsel, which is our main contact for discovery. So you have to remember any documentation that you write is disclosable to both the defense and the prosecuting. So just be mindful of that. It's very sensitive uh, uh, information that's in there. So remember that whatever you do impacts the criminal justice system. And that's what we want to aid in order to determine whether or not someone is guilty. Great, thank you. So if somebody actually could come to our laboratory, if they went upstairs, they would see people wearing masks and lab coats. They'd see a lot of um, expensive laboratory equipment. It might look very much like a typical research laboratory, let's say, but we're a forensic science laboratory. So what is it? What should people know that makes it different? What distinguishes the science that we're doing? It's still good science, but what distinguishes the job that a scientist would do in a forensic laboratory versus scientists that might be working in a research laboratory? Okay. So earlier, Dr. Smith mentioned that we are an independent lab. We are an independent and accredited lab. So Accreditation essentially, so we have a third party come in and we have an accrediting body, um, ANAP, which uh, is probably one of the largest accrediting bodies that I'm aware of. In addition to North America, I think they at least provide a service in 75 different countries. And um, what does accreditation mean? It essentially means that we have a quality management system. We have a dedicated quality team to make sure we meet all our requirements that we adhere to all the ISO 17025 requirements, the FBI QAS requirements. So don't think 
that once you have your bachelor's degree and you come in and you start casework, that it's just a matter of doing the test and actually just issuing the report. We have in the, in the Department of Forensic Sciences, to give you an idea, you have the departmental operational manuals, then you have the divisional, Chris has his own uh, laboratory operating manuals, so does the Forensic Science Lab, and then each unit as its own. And then if you look at something like uh, so some units like biology, they have essentially regulations, several regulations that they have to adhere to. And then in addition to that, you still have your uh, scientific community, kind of what testing protocols you're going to use and so forth. So it's a lot of work that has to go into um, a, uh, a forensic science lab, but it's important work because it tells the customer that, hey, we have accurate and reliable testing and services that we provide. So one last question, because I think it's important that if, what are you looking for in a person who may come and want to be a scientist? What are some of the, the skills and knowledge they might bring? And then maybe what are some of the skills and knowledge we're gonna to have to teach them here? Because some of the disciplines you can only learn about by coming and working in a forensic laboratory. So in the last couple that's minutes, a, can you yeah. tell us about that? That's a really good question. So um, there's a lot of disciplines where you can um, have an intro, like biology, you can have an introductory level course. So typically, so you have uh, your position description that each lab will have, and that will tell you what the requirements are. And typically it's a bachelor's degree. It can either be in chemistry, it can be in biology, life science, so if you have a four year bachelor's degree, you're in a fairly good position to be a strong candidate to apply for any one of those positions. I'll also suggest that you, um, you'll uh, hear through some of the material that we provide that uh, to join a, an internship program. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that though, if you're looking at some of the pattern recognition disciplines, um, there's no way you can come after your four year degree and just start and doing casework. So there's an intense, 24 month program that the lab that hires you will take you through that process. So there's various levels uh, that you have to go through. You're gonna have to complete uh, different modules. Um, you're gonna have to complete different tests, evaluation assignments, and eventually you're gonna have to do a mock exercise and then do competency and proficiency tests. Um, so I encourage you to essentially join uh, one of those programs uh, the Department of Forensic Sciences in 2017 um, have established a partnership with Trinity University, and we already have some of those graduates uh, that's coming through that graduated last year. And then, uh, so those are the candidates that would be strong candidates when we advertise positions here in the district. So as, as Wayne was saying, for those disciplines, latent fingerprints, uh, firearms examination, we call those pattern recognition disciplines, those are disciplines where you would want to get some, you would have to get some on the job training uh, uh, in a forensic laboratory. But if you're interested in chemistry or biology, certainly those are programs you could find at a major university, a degree in chemistry or biology um, that might put you on a path towards forensic biology testing or forensic chemistry. So now you've heard from the, the three of us, we actually have a film that highlights some of our folks that work here, and they're going to give you some additional pointers about what they love about forensic sciences, and then maybe some tips on if you're interested in that as a discipline. Anytime I tell someone that I'm a forensic scientist, their first uh, response is, oh wow, that is so cool. When I first thought about being in the forensic field, I was more geared towards crime scene because this is what you see on TV. You see people going to the crime scenes, trying to solve it. But I knew that I was more um, interested in the DNA side of it. I get asked all types of questions. Well, is our DNA floating around? And I'm like, no, your DNA is not floating around. Because 
because everyone thinks that if you just walk somewhere, your DNA, and yes, there's things of shedding and things like that, but no. Or they also want to know what DNA stands for, and of course, I have no problem explaining what <laughs> DNA stands for, and when I tell them deoxyribonucleic acid, they're like, okay, uh, that's okay, you, you handle that, you stay in that field. But it's always, it's always really fun to explain what I do, because I love it. Just recently, my, my neighbor's kids asked, you know, what, what do you do when you come in, where they see me come home from work, they're outside playing, they asked, what do I do? And I said, oh, I work in forensic sciences, I'm a firearms examiner, and they really had no concept, like they had seen TV with forensic science, but they're like, well, what does that mean? So that's usually the next question. So, well, what is your job? And then we go into you know, talking about test firing firearms and using microscopes to compare them. For most people, it's kind of hard to wrap their head around that I handle drugs, um, simply put, that I handle drugs day in and day out, but that is my job. Cocaine, heroin, PCP, um, THC, Delta 9, tetrahydrocannabinol. I did grow up in the, really the big boom in crime television. Uh, I even remember probably you know, ninth or 10th grade, there were even articles that were starting to come out in newspapers and online that were pointing out real life forensics versus what we see as TV forensics. One show, and I won't say the name of the show, but I noticed that they are the officer, the detectives, then they're going to the lab and they're processing the case, then they're doing their digital evidence. No, with us, it's a team. A scientist that specialize in latent fingerprints. You have scientists that specialize in ballistics like guns. Um, you have our digital evidence unit. You have the forensic biology unit. So everyone has their different skill set um, and we all just work together. It's interesting because we think of it as a puzzle. So everyone is um, has a piece to this puzzle that they're trying to assist with solving. And so, yeah, we just, we all all play we all have a different piece to put together to the puzzle. One of the biggest misconceptions is that it takes two seconds to solve a crime. We don't know within 20 seconds that yes, in fact, this is cocaine or any other controlled drug. Um, it takes lo much longer than that, and we have to prepare it. Then we have to write a lot of, there's a lot of paperwork involved in it that you don't see on TV. You won't see TV shows where firearms technicians are test firing 10, 15, 20 firearms a day just to generate known samples. You're not gonna see database entries being done, um, even though those are some of our most important functions. I actually knew I wanted to be in forensics since high school. Um, I attended a high school that had a science and technology program. So we were able to take a forensic science course, and once I took that course, I knew that this is what I wanted to do, or at least focus on. And in college, um, I just was looking for colleges that had a forensic science program or something equivalent. Yes, you do have to deal with bodily fluids. You do have to deal with blood. You do have to deal with semen. You do. So this is something that you kind of know. My career path was kind of preset pretty early on. Uh, I luckily was able to attend a vocational school in high school. So for three years, I took criminal justice classes, uh, which covered policing, courts, corrections. Uh, but the uh, forensic aspect is what really spoke out to me and that's what guided me into then taking classes at college. I went in and I pursued an advanced track that allowed me to both get a bachelor's and a master's degree in a five-year program and I came out having a very good understanding of the broad scope of forensic science. Um, but what I didn't really know at that point was what did I want to focus on. I hadn't spent four or five years focusing only on ballistics or fingerprints. So I decided that I was going to get out in the job market and admittedly take what I could find as a new college graduate. Um, and I got into evidence processing, chemically processing evidence for fingerprints. Um, and what that told me was that I really liked the lab setting. I really enjoyed the pattern matching discipline, which you see in both firearms as well as fingerprints. I had kind of decided firearms was where I wanted to look next. Uh, I applied, got the position, and really at that point almost immediately recognized that this was really where my interest lied. These are cases where firearms were recovered, where shell casings have been recovered, where bullets have been recovered. Those are not 
inconsequential crimes. These are not vandalism. These aren't you know somebody kicking over trash cans. These are real world instances where deadly weapons have been used, and sometimes, unfortunately, you know there are lives associated with that. So everything we do, from the cases that we made just test fire, um, the database entries, all the microscope comparisons, those all have the potential to lead to somebody's life. Um, so really, I mean, I would argue every case we have um, has impact. We don't know like the full story, and we never get the full story. Um, so we, the officers do the front end work, and then the rest of the court and everyone involved in that aspect does the back end of it. Um, we kind of just prove the facts of a small snippet. So sometimes I do wish I got kind of like the full story, but I don't in any way want it to influence my work and what I do. What you do in the lab is kind of, is very, it's used in court to help prosecute, like to prosecute an individual. So it's kind of, it's important work that we're doing. I think going through undergrad, I think that's kind of a little bit undermined the actual testifying part of this job because it is very nerve wracking and you do get nervous, but like I'm sticking to the facts of which I test but yes everything becomes you kind of get like you're just like turning like into like high gear once you do enter the court um, because this is impacting someone's life and you're testifying on the facts of the case and you do see another individual sitting there and it's it, that I think that to me is what's most impactful about our job that we do and I think like probably is like the hardest part of it. That is also what makes us great scientists is because we do understand that there's a human aspect to this. We do know that on the other side of this evidence, a crime has occurred. Um, there's innocent people and there's guilty people. I do feel like I'm making a difference. I do feel like I am contributing to keeping the district and the surrounding areas safe. If I could give advice to myself, um, doing the math, 10 years ago, wow. Um, my advice would be if you haven't, definitely look into your internships now. Most labs have internships uh, all over the place and are sh often struggling to fill them. Um, but those internships are an invaluable way to do what I had to do over the course of years as an employee. Most of those internships will get you several weeks in each unit that the lab offers, and it will allow you to get that in-depth look of, oh, do I want to work with firearms, or do I find firearms to be kind of a, an area that doesn't hold my interest? Is biology what interests you, or do you want to think, I never thought about crime scene sciences, but now that I've done it, it really does seem exciting. Um, so really getting exposure to the real world aspects of any forensics department um, is definitely a, a way to get a leg up. My advice for getting into the forensic science field would be for sure um, getting exposure. Um, so by that I meant going and trying to get an internship as soon as you can. I know it's a little hard um, because most of these are unpaid internships that are being offered specifically in the forensic science field, um, but that would be one of my um, recommendations. In 2013 I actually started out as an intern in the forensic biology unit so that was one of the best experiences because not only did it allow me to interact with the people or the scientists that I will eventually be working with and build that relationship and that connection, it also allowed me to get an in-depth look at what it was like to be a forensic scientist. The forensic community is always evolving, so if you are someone who likes to stay involved and like to learn, it's a really good field to be in. All right, uh, hi everyone. My name is Anna Muckenthus and I am the Education Program Specialist at the National Law Enforcement Museum. Um, I work with our uh, education programs, uh, all the education programs that come through the museum, um, including this one here. And uh, this is not my first time working with Department of Forensic Science. Um, they help us a lot with our forensic programming at the museum. Um, and we were really excited to bring them on here for this program today. So I'm going to be um, reading off your questions for Dr. Smith and her colleagues to answer. Um, and so let's get started. So our first question is from Morgan um, and it's two questions. Um, so I'll ask you the first one first and then go into the second one. Um, are there dedicated personnel at DFS that focus specifically on cold cases? 
That's an excellent question. Right now, we actually have a grant um, that we are, uh, BJA grant out of the Department of Justice that we are working with both uh, investigators from the Metropolitan Police Department, as well as attorneys from the United States Attorney's Office. So it's sort of a, a group effort to look at cold cases and to be able to take some cases and see if we can go back. These are cases where we have either have no suspect, but we have DNA evidence, go back and send those off to other contract laboratories who are helping us with that familial testing, that deeper dive into the DNA that's present to see if we can have any connections. We just literally have sent some cases out for that. Um, and we look forward to hopefully getting some interesting results from that. And Morgan's second question actually goes back to that familial DNA. Um, does DFS use familial DNA searching to um, solve some of these cold cases or help to solve some of these cold cases? Yes, we definitely hope to. We will have to do that though in conjunction with laboratories that have the broader technical capability to do that sort of DNA testing that we don't do internally. And then we will work with them to access different databases that are out there. And that's gonna be a combination effort between our lab folks, as well as the detectives that we're working with. So we look forward to that. Excellent. And then uh, we have another question. We have a question from Lauren. Um, how much of DFS investigators time is spent in court or preparing for court compared to their work in the lab? Do the same people who did the lab work also present the evidence in court? Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna to turn to both uh, Chris to answer that question from a crime scene scientist perspective, and then we'll ask Wayne. Chris? Uh, so, uh, I would say in the past that uh, when I was on the police department that we were being called into court more often. Um, we do have people going into court to testify about the evidence that they collected and how they went about collecting it. Um, I, I would say uh, maybe about 10% of their time is spent going to court, whereas 90% of their time is actually doing the actual work. So, um, that and, would... and that might be a little bit different for um, some of the, the laboratories that uh, units of work under Wayne. I, can, I know that, uh, for example, I can, I'll let Wayne speak also, but I know our forensic chemistry group can be very, very busy and can be going to testify quite a bit as to the drug analysis that they're doing. And then that may vary from for the rest of the units. Wayne? Yes. So uh, one of the important aspects of uh, preparing for court is that while you are completing your examination, you will be documenting that in your technical notes. So you will, as you do your observations, your analysis and your results and your interpretations, you put that in your technical notes. So we would go into a case file docket and then the report will go out to the police agencies. Now, when you get a subpoena a couple of years later, then um, essentially you will go and pull that case file. It would have gone through to the discovery through our general legal, uh, through our legal department. And then for an examiner to prepare, it's literally just going, I guess, through the case notes that you've uh, taken a year or two years ago to refresh your memory as to what you did um, with those items and how you kind of reported that. Um, and that varied depending on the size of the case. Um, but typically, uh, the fundamental premise of your science, you would know that as general knowledge, and then you would just have to refresh your memory with respect to the actual evidence that you did in that specific case. Yes, and I, I think our forensic chemists probably go the most, um, and then our, our, our DNA and firearms and latent fingerprint examiners would follow in their testimony. And I, I also think part of the question was, do the examiners who actually do the testing testify? Yes, they do. In, uh, I used to be with the FBI. The FBI, we had analysts who would help us, technicians who would help us, and then I as an examiner would testify to their work. That's not the case here at Washington. Uh, the folks that do the science actually take it to court and testify about it. And then uh, we actually have a follow-up question uh, from John. How often are the lab examiners required to testify in court? 
Well, uh, things have really changed during COVID. So nobody's really testifying right now because the courts are in essence sort of shut down. Um, but for some of our folks, they may go testify once a week as a part of their job. As I said, I think our forensic chemist team is the busiest um, and they are going very often. Um, whereas other people may not be testifying as much um, in some of the other disciplines. Excellent. And then uh, I have a really good question here from Wendy. Um, what is the most exciting new technology on the horizon for forensic sciences? Oh, where do I start and how much time do we have? A um, couple things. One thing that we're looking at in our pattern recognition sciences, we have a great new process. It's not that new, but it's new to us, but it's called MIDEO, where you can actually put a latent fingerprint, a digital image of it, and the examiner can make markings of it. And then that can all be sort of a race so that a second examiner can come in and look at it completely blind to what the other person's thoughts were. So that's very powerful. We have 3D imaging of the striations and markings you see on firearms. Um, and so that's something we're looking at. We're looking at the, not only being able to look at it under a scope, but to scan sort of the outside of that casing, get those markings, and then have that compared digitally. So that's an exciting piece. Um, I'm personally, I have a love for DNA. That's my background. So we are bringing on what's called next generation sequencing. And so to the first person's question, someday we will be able to sequence the portions of DNA that are now being done in contract labs. So we'll be able to do familial searching in here. But the area that is just exploding is anything that has to do with these cell phones and, and any kind of uh, technology that collects digital information. These are invaluable pieces of, of evidence that if you think about all the interactions you have with your phone, we capture that. And we're able to get into and discern from any phone that is brought to us what that information is. So this is probably the biggest area of new things that will be coming out on the horizon. And then uh, our next question kind of touches on this too. Um, have there been any technology advances in crime scene bullet trajectory analysis? Well, I'm gonna leave that to the two gentlemen sitting <laughs> next to me. That's Wayne's there. Okay, so we're gonna to turn to Wayne for the trajectory analysis. Okay, so we have different 3D scanning systems that essentially is manufactured. There's a couple of manufacturers out there that essentially do the 3D. But when it comes to crime scene reconstruction, um, essentially, okay, as like essentially with crime scene reconstruction, you essentially, when it comes to the trajectory of firearms, um, you need two points. And um, there's different laser upgrades, essentially, that you can use different technology measuring devices that's more digital. But at the bottom line, it comes to, down to a, a human, the actual technician that we're gonna have to make those two points count and um, uh, uh, place those two points in order to get measurements, in order to determine an angle to tell you where the person was standing at the time of the whole things. Um, so there's that old school tradition, there might be minor changes in measuring devices that, that might be improved, but the, the, the big manufacturers, they now using uh, 3D scanners, essentially to capture and document that crime scene. So it depends as to what you want to reconstruct and what you want to illustrate in court will determine essentially um, what type of instrumentation you want to use. And then I have quite a few questions um, kind of about uh, from, it looks like they're from students um, about that are interested in working in forensic science. Um, they're very interested in um, if they're going to study crime scenes or if they want to do a career in that crime scene sciences, um, like what Chris is uh, the director of, um, what would be the most useful way um, or what degree would be the most useful compared to uh, working in the forensic lab? So I actually think the, the best thing to do is be as broad as possible when you're working, when you're going through school, because um, we want you to have a long career. And though you may have, as some of the scientists that spoke to you today, they may have focused on crime scene sciences, but ultimately they went into another 
more in the laboratory type discipline. So if you think about it that way, as long as you have a strong science, if you like biology, take biology. If you like chemistry, take chemistry. If you like physics, take physics. We do want our crime scene sciences folks to come with some kind of science background because it helps you understand the data you'll be collecting, documentation, and some of the more mundane things that we actually ask our crime scene scientists to do. But you also want to make sure you understand the uh, criminal justice system here in the United States. So you should take courses in that. You should understand how the criminal justice system works because that's mainly the, the system that you're going to be supporting. But that's what we're looking for. But I would get that science. I would still get that because that serves you well down the road if you want to change or if the laboratory you work for wants you to do more than just crime scene. There are some labs where uh, the scientists will go out and actually collect the evidence, bring it back, and then do some of the evidence processing. So that would bode well for you if you had your foot in both worlds. But the key is an internship. That is really the key, that you need to find out if you are cut out for this. Because when you walk into a laboratory, and that's why we've talked a little bit about the documentation and, and those things, you want to make sure you're going to be a good fit. It's all very exciting, but until you see the day-to-day, -day, um, I think you that's when you'll really help you decide what you want to do. So um, we really stress that. We actually offer internships here. COVID-19 has affected the amount of internships. And we don't just have internships for the science side. I'm sitting here in this room with my amazing comms team who put together those videos, and I'm looking at an intern who's actually here supporting our communications team. So I think that's what you should look at. You should knock on the door of local laboratories in your area, see if they could use some help and at least get that sort of taste of what it's really like within the buildings or out on the streets. Excellent. And then um, I have an, uh, a question specifically for Chris. Um, what, if you already have some experience with the DC Police Department and uh, a criminal justice degree, um, how would that get you into, uh, how could you use that experience to get uh, into the Department of Forensic Science? So uh, we recently looked at that because a lot of people do take criminal justice classes because traditionally uh, these crime scene sciences jobs were through the police department. So recently we went back and um, upgraded our position descriptions for entry level to allow for people with criminal justice backgrounds to come in as an entry level person. Um, for our more experience, you have to come in with some level of experience. Uh, if you came in at say, for instance, a grade 11 or 12, you would have to have um, some crime scene experience. So you would have had to already work somewhere else. But we have recognized that a lot of people do take criminal justice classes because they're on the fence. Do they want to go into a lab? Do they want to be on the police department? You know, there's just a lot of different areas of interest. So um, there is a path, at least in DC, for people to get in. I can't speak for any other jurisdictions. And then um, the last question that we will answer is about um, the actual, like, uh, testing of evidence in the lab. Um, it's a really good question from Isaiah, which is, Pretty interesting. Um, how long does it take to actually process fingerprints to match at a crime scene? So I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So if the, if the evidence comes in and it is processed through chemical enhancement, right? It can be, it can, and we might be able to see something um, from the scene itself. We actually try to move that evidence through very quickly within one day or two days of receiving that evidence. But then the print has to move into our latent fingerprint uh, examination unit. Then they will take a look at it. They will actually utilize and put that information into what's called APHIS, which is the, the fingerprint uh, national database that we utilize. We may get uh, a connection through the use of that database. So it may be very quick. This may happen very quickly. The good news is they have about a 12 day turnaround time and they have very little backlog. So here in DC, they're actually able to process all the evidence that's coming to them within at least 12 days. And sometimes we get connections very, very quickly. One thing's for sure, it's not like DB, it's much more than 20 seconds. 
but we actually have had times where we move the evidence through and within the next day or the same day, we're able to make some connections through our latent fingerprint process. So it can actually be one of the fastest disciplines um, here in the uh, Department of Forensic Sciences. Yeah. And just to add on to what Dr. Smith said, so the average turnaround time is 12 days, which is mm -hmm. excellent. However, we are extremely responsive to expedited or priority requests. Um, for example, like on last week, Monday, we had the commander from MPD call us with three priority requests at 12 o'clock, and we could give them a close of business day on the same day, verified results. So we are extremely responsive. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we want to provide an aid to advance an investigation. So even though we have the routine casework, so that's what you're gonna get if you become a scientist, you can have your assigned work that's given to you by your manager when you get in in the morning, and then all of a sudden at 12, you change that itch and, and here's an expedited case that I want before you go home today. So that's kind of the life of a forensic scientist here at the department. All right. Um, and I think that's all the time we have for questions. There were a lot of really good questions today. Um, and uh, I thank you all for your submissions and thank you to the Department of Forensic Science uh, for joining us today. And I'm gonna turn it over to Marsha for some closing remarks. So thank you, Dr. Smith, Chris, Wayne. Today's program was not only interesting and compelling, it really helped further understanding the story of American law enforcement and gave us a lot to think about in terms of the many facets to the profession and what it takes to keep our community safe. Programs like this are integral to our mission and we rely heavily on our community of supporters to help serve uh, the public. Today, our mission matters more than ever. We need your support. We need the support of the audience. Um, and the audience can make a donation to the National Law Enforcement Memorial and Museum, and we make it really easy. You can text MORE 2018. Not sure why it's 2018, but I'll figure that out later. Okay. Text MORE, M-O-R-E 2018 to 4144. Again, that's MORE 2018, no spaces, to 4144. Four. 41444. Um, and our next program uh, is Breaking the Blue Ceiling. It's attracting, a training, uh, attr attracting, retaining, and advancing women in law enforcement. And that will be held on December 9th at 2 p.m. So thank you again to our participants from the DC Department of Forensic Sciences and to all of you attending. Make it a great day. Thank you.